Okay. Um, yeah, my name is uh, Abdullah, as you know. Um, so I'll be moderating this panel. So we've been discussing a lot since like the whole batch working group, um, the idea of coming up with, with the batch working group, because we always thought that Kubernetes was mostly optimized for service type workloads. We, there've been a lot of optimizations related to, um, you know, services like, you know, um, topology based routing, the rolling updates, um, and all these kind of things. We were focused on microservices. And now, as we've seen recently, now that like Kubernetes become pretty much a de facto um, orchestrator for containers and proved to be quite nice to run service type workloads, the community is trying to converge other types of workloads on that same platform. But because we haven't focused as a community on running batch workloads on Kubernetes, there are a lot of gaps there, we know that. Um, and so we thought like, okay, maybe we should discuss this and have a look. We, we have these discussions a lot, right? Like during the day, we have multiple talks. It's giving us like a, basically a laundry list of gaps. Um, but people are still running batch workloads in Kubernetes, even though we have all these gaps. Um, and so we thought like, what about bring four different uh, platforms that were built on top of Kubernetes. We have a platform from G Research Armada, we've got Unicorn, we have MCAD from IBM, and we have Kubeflux, or Flux, I guess, uh, from uh, Los Angeles uh, National Labs. It's uh, Fluence from Lawrence Livermore and IBM. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so the panel, I guess, we, what we could discuss here is the, what are the gaps that we have in Kubernetes to run batch workloads and how we can um, bridge these gaps um, and I guess we can start um, from Daniel. Sure, yeah. Um, so I just want to you know, start off by saying my background is in HPC and bare metal HPC. I've kind of been introduced to the Kubernetes ecosystem relatively recently and been really, really excited by its capabilities and its abilities to enhance HPC itself. Um, so I think one thing one thing that I like to think about in terms of HPC versus Kubernetes is declarative versus imperative uh, models. And from my point of view, HPC comes from a much more imperative model in that the user wants to, is, cust is customized or is used to specifying exactly how things will run, exactly where, because they assume that they know best how to get the most performance out of their particular application versus the Kubernetes model is much more declarative oriented where basically you want to maintain a particular state. So how, how basically can we merge these two models together and can you, is that even possible to begin with? Um, I think that's, that's a real big challenge. I don't know if there, that's a gap per se in, in batch for Kubernetes. It's I think more of a clash of, of models that hopefully will converge on one another. Diana, you want to introduce yourself and why you're interested in batch on
Thank you. Albin, do you want to introduce yourself and Sure, so my name is Albin, and I work with Jamie on the Armada project, with the presentation that he held earlier. And so uh, let's go into three things that we have sort of figured out is challenging with running our batch workloads on top of Kubernetes. And indeed, we, these are some of the things that we try to alleviate with, with Armada. And so one of these things is that we're really scared about overloading etcd. And Armada was originally designed as a buffer to be placed in front of etcd, such that when one of the users submits 100,000 jobs within, say, 10 seconds, we don't cause etcd to completely fall over. Right? Because etcd does total order broadcast. If any one user completely overloads etcd, uh, there's no service for anyone on that cluster anymore. Um, the second thing is that, as discussed previously, sort of um, HPC workloads are often designed in a very much in a, when this happens, do something else. And so there are events in Kubernetes, right? But these things are sort of informational and not really designed to build automation on top of. In particular, something that we are sort of struggling a bit with now is determining from outside a cluster if a pod was preempted. As it turns out that the kube schedule will preempt the pod and then after that create an event saying that the pod was preempted. But there's no guarantees that this event will actually be produced or indeed on any ordering between that event and other events. And so looking into the cluster, it can be difficult to determine what happens to your pods and to act accordingly. And finally, um, you know, because Kubernetes is sort of grew up in the microservices world, there's still a lot of tooling missing. For example, gang scheduling, there's a lot of fragmentation around gang scheduling, and this is something that we really want to support in Armada, and it's not really clear how we will do this. There's many options. Thank you. Wilfred? Yeah, so Wilfred Spiegelberg uh, from Apache Unicorn. Um, we started working on Apache Unicorn from the YARN perspective. So like Weiwei, I, I come from the YARN perspective. We've got a lot of these things like job queuing, hierarchical queues, user quotas. Um, that's all there. So when we see people that want to move to Kubernetes, the first question is, is what they ask is, so are you gonna give me all the functionality that I've got on Yarn? So do you do you, do you do queuing, do you do quotas, do you do all that stuff on the fly? Um, and imp do you implement uh, strict security? Uh, on Hadoop we run with Kerberos enabled, every single thing is Kerberos all the way through the pod or the, the JVM that you run on the system. So that principle is there. And when you look at Kubernetes from, from our perspective, it was also like we're missing that user information going through the scheduling cycle. So accounting for resource usage. And I've, I've heard a number of people say that that's difficult. So how do you get that through there? Um, preemption from, f from batch jobs it often matters exactly which pot you preempt. Um, if you preempt the driver pot from Spark, your whole Spark application is gone. So it could be far more costly to preempt that one driver pot than preempting 10 executor pots overall. So, and that, that difference, you, you, you can't make that difference. The scheduler is not aware of that information. So. We're trying to get that kind of information into the system. So that's missing from, from, from our perspective. So on top of a number of the other things that are already mentioned, it's, it's two different worlds almost. We've got a lot to talk about here. So we've got multi-cluster, we've got quota and queuing and bin packing. Um, so before uh, going to the to the audience the questions, I have like one high level question here, which is, do we believe, like since you've been working with Kubernetes uh, for a while now, do we believe that there's something fundamentally wrong with Kubernetes that makes it wrong or like limiting that makes it hard to build on top of ba uh, to build batch frameworks on top of it, but we have to do it because. Well, it's the cool thing out there and we have to basically unify our infrastructure around something, you know, common. I think I can give a quick hook into et cetera D. 
when you're looking at batch jobs and batch things, there's users that, that will submit hundreds of jobs at one go, uh, which could be thousands of bots. So overloading, et cetera, D is a real problem and you need to be really careful. And that's also why what Apple did, what I hear, um, we had a meetup last week, Pinterest also, they all stop scaling at 800 to 1,000 nodes. They say, we don't go any further. We do not want to get into problems with etc. D. So that's a real thing that we've all got. Um. <laughs> yeah, so I completely agree. Okay, let's try again. Okay, it seems safe now. Yeah, so I say like ETCD is something that we're really concerned about. Um, and indeed, it looks like at least that sort of for the system that we try to build, relying only on ETCD is essentially like an impossibility. Because indeed, we have users that submit, say, 100,000 jobs simultaneously. And so as a, as a result, instead, we're relying on Pulsar, which does sort of a partition total order broadcast, and which allows us to scale to, say, two orders of magnitude higher than ETCD. The other thing that is a fundamental problem with Kubernetes that will be very difficult to change is the events. Because events, so Kubernetes will do something and then afterwards publish an event that it did it. And there are many components that concurrently publish these events. Because of this architecture, you can never guarantee event ordering or delivery. And so they will never be reliable. So this is also something that we try to alleviate with Armada, whereby Armada will Armada is itself event driven, so Armada does guarantee event delivery and ordering. Um, but at the point at which we interact with Kubernetes, we don't have these guarantees and we have to sort of try to do the best we can. Uh, yeah, so I'd like to piggyback off of what uh, several of the other presenters or panelists have said so far. Um, one of the things I mentioned toward the end of my presentation on Fluence was a project that we're working on called the Flux Operator. And the idea behind this is to instantiate a mini cluster inside of Kubernetes that will provide full feature batch scheduling. So this is the scheduling, the queuing, basically everything inside of it. And there are some difficulties that, that we've run into so far. And I, I said before that there aren't really limitations that that's not exactly true. So one of the things um, that, that we've run into is the difficulty in figuring out when um, some of the worker pods are ready state. So the, 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 way, that Flux, the way that Flux will wire up is that uh, the workers will start and then communicate with via a tree-based overlay network to a broker rank zero. And they basically signal that they are ready over that particular network. So if there were an internal kind of a, a intermediate state or a state after running that was more specific to that, then maybe that broker could query that state from within this group of pods and then transition to running where it could actually execute uh, the, the application MPI or whatever it, it was afterwards. I have some follow-ups on each um, item here, but I want to open it first to the um, audience if anybody has any, like, questions. Um, 
uh, more of an observation. So I don't have an HPC batch background. I have been working with Kubernetes since 2017, uh, running in production in a big bank. And as an architect, uh, I get a thought, should you want to do a basically lift and shift from the traditional world to the Kubernetes world? Or should you put some of the changes at the application side as well and not try to fix all the problems? Um, yes, you, you you can shift some of the work towards the um, the submitted towards the application side of things, um, but if you look at um, let's say uh, a Spark job when you process data, you do not know exactly how many executors you will use or will will have to use until you know what your data is. So you don't want to take that, dynam that dynamic capability away because if you take it away, then you either extend the processing time or you waste resources because you're, you're, you're only using half of the executors. So <coughs> pulling that information out and then saying, oh, if you put that in a, in a gateway kind of thing and you do it all beforehand, then we can make it easier for Kubernetes uh, to work with. Y yeah, your mileage may vary, uh, so you will you will get somewhere. I know from um, ApacheCon that there are a couple of companies that are working on, on pulling that information all into an application outside, but they also say that's a continual process and they analyze every single Spark job that they've run. So the overhead becomes also pretty big on your on your side. So I'll just comment. So I think sort of with modern computers, one of the sort of successful design principles has been to make computers so that it appears to the applications running on them as they have the whole computer for themselves and there's no contention and so on. And one can make the same argument for the modern Kubernetes and distributed world, right? Let's try to make the platform such that to the, from the point of view of the applications, right? It's like running on your local PC, right? But maybe we have reached a limit where that's no longer feasible and we have to just fundamentally write new applications built for this new world. And I think there's some truth to that. Now it's working. Okay. So I, I think one of you mentioned uh, this um, um, challenge that we have that uh, frequently we, we hear mentioned in the context of HPC that users want to control everything and they want to like drive everything. But then, like, interestingly, like, I think two talks before we've seen that f funny slide from, from that uh, Czech University presentation where uh, like where it was showing like how bad users are in like efficiency of their workloads, which is I, to my experience at least a good representation how bad um, most users are in in controlling these things. So I'm wondering whether our drive towards all of these very sophisticated features, towards controlling the processes, controlling scheduling, aren't we? What, what's your opinion? Aren't we actually over-indexing? on a very small fraction of power users versus delivering something that is going to be more broadly uh, powerful for, for broader community. So at least um, sort of at G Research, our users are absolutely terrible in knowing what they want. Um, on the other hand, they're using state-of-the-art machine learning frameworks and the authors of those frameworks know exactly what they're supposed to need. And so I think that's where you want to put the smarts of figuring out exactly sort of what pneuma topology awareness is necessary for this particular application and so on. Because at the end of the day, they don't really write normal general purpose code for submitting into our clusters. They just express their problem in terms of some high level framework. And that high level framework can do all of this for them, I believe. Right.
All right. Okay. I hear myself now. So let, let me restart. I think that's a really interesting question. I think that it's true that a lot of users don't understand how to squeeze the most amount of uh, capability out of a given set of hardware. But I think on the other hand, that there are power users as well um, that run at extremely large scale, like exascale. Um, and that is something that, that, that users need to be able to do in order to squeeze as much capability out of you know, really cutting edge machines to do science at massive, massive scales. Um, so I think I think Kubernetes needs to be able to do both in that sense because I see that um, there's an increasing amount of interest for these large-scale, complex scientific workflows to run anywhere, not just on uh, bare metal and HPC, but also in Kubernetes in the cloud. Yeah, I wanted to go back to something earlier that you know it's a common pattern that people use multi-cluster because one one control plane can't take it. That actually really speaks to the fact that either we accept that or and or we invest to try to make one control plane larger, which is probably never going to work. But as a batch community, what can we do to make federated clusters? Because it's such a common pattern. Literally all of us seem to have a solution for and f start to foment something that is reusable between solutions. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so, yeah, I think that's that's a great observation, and it's something we've been thinking about for for some time. Um, I do think that uh, at some level we need to start to think about how we do this federation for batch jobs across the, the different clusters, but in an upstream point of view, um, whether we... Uh, enable the ability to uh, provision clusters just for scheduling. In other words, you're, you have a scheduling sort of mini cluster. Uh, there's some interesting work uh, with KPC, which provides an API, uh, uh, Kubernetes API, I don't know if folks are familiar with that, which, which is something we may be able to, to look at, which would be able to put a, a, a scheduler behind that that would uh, would federate uh, workloads across the different clusters, um, but I, I do think it should be part of the uh, batch work group uh, agenda, at least to evaluate how we might approach it. Uh, but I think there's a lot more work that needs to be done for that. Um, I just have one quick comment about this as well. Like all the solutions that we've seen were mostly related to specific use cases, right? Like we had the Spark, implemented for Spark. Uh, we have implemented for specific type of workloads, um, uh, embarrassingly parallel, for example. The challenge is actually coming up with something extremely generic and acceptable by the community. That is, I, in, my, in my opinion, that's like 10x more complex. Um, so you can definitely solve it for one or two problems, but then if you wanna make it generic, it, that's where the complexity starts to like, you know, shoot up. Let me add on to what Abdullah said also. It's not just the cluster that needs to scale then, but if you use, for instance, the Spark operator or something else, all these things need to scale up. And what we've seen with our users that have been using, for instance, the Spark operator, it does not scale up that high either. So you've already got multiple instances of the operator in the cluster of a thousand nodes. So, it is, yeah, you can, you can do one little bit, but if you don't have every single little bit in your whole chain, you don't scale up anyway. So, so um, quick question on the math involved. So different chips have different, some of them don't follow the IEEE standards. So if you look at the cell architecture, for instance, for the PS PlayStations, they don't follow it. And they're not the only ones that have different architecture for floating point. How do you think we should move forward to make sure that the math is correct if we're looking for actual accuracy? I understand training doesn't always matter, but other workloads do. So Q has this really, the Q project has this really nice uh, feature which is called node flavors. I believe you can comment on this. I guess you know better than me. 
whereby you have some set of labels, I believe, right? And a particular set of labels that have the same value denotes a particular node flavor. And so, for example, scheduling could guarantee that all of your nodes are scheduled across nodes with identical node flavors, which I think would be an elegant solution to problems such as this. At least then you are consistently incorrect if you are incorrect. Hi guys, see if this works. Uh, so w one thing that seems to be kind of an assumption is that something else has to get bolted in to do a lot of coordination, either federation between different clusters, different scheduling frameworks, loading things into the scheduling framework and the operator stack. My, my question kind of goes to the start before you get to that layer. What is the expected user interface for just coming in and throwing batch workload at a system? And then how does that feed back into those designs and how you tackle user identities versus RBAC? Do you have any sort of approach that starts to tackle that? Uh, and and kind of where does that then spill over into the rest of this architecture? So from a unicorn perspective, we have taken the approach that we want to support things as simple as possible. No CIDs, nothing. We allow you to, uh, or we schedule based on annotations that you put on a pot and that's it. The rest we use the standard Kubernetes objects. So we've tried to keep it as simple as possible, as close to uh, Kubernetes as we can. That's, that was the whole setup that we, we started with. So, and for, from a user perspective, um, we're working on user quotas at the moment. Uh, we're working on the design doc, so that's, uh, that's coming up. And uh, I think that's going upstream um, probably in the next two weeks or so. So design docs uh, should be around on the Apache Unicorn website and how we think about tackling that. It's a whole different story. Yeah, so in, Amo in our model land, we have the notion of a job that we use is that of essentially a bag of Kubernetes objects. And so you'll give us your bag of Kubernetes objects and you say, one of them is my main object. And whenever that object then dies for whatever reason, typically it's a pod that runs to completion, we just kill all of the other resources. And user identity is based entirely around queues. So you, when you give us your bag of objects, you tell them put all of these bags, this bag of objects into this queue, and then that maps to a single namespace inside of Kubernetes. And so in this way, I think it's sort of, we try to keep it fairly Kubernetes native while still making it appear as to be sort of a batch style job with a life cycle that is easy to reason about. Um. In, in the MCAT world, um, we are about to release a, a quota management solution where um, it's hierarchical, there's borrowing and sharing, uh, and essentially you can uh, express it as a, an RBAC identity, right? You define how you want to uh, label all of these quotas related to it. Uh, there's no specific integration with actually reading the RBAC uh, objects, but uh, uh, that's something that we could look at. But in the, in initially, we allow the, what we're calling the quota admin to be able to define what those definitions are and then set the limits. And then with that, uh, obviously, you can uh, manage the users in that way. I guess one, like one major difference between, of course, services and batch workloads with services, like you have I don't know, the user has, a, there's a service which is a web page, right? With batch, the user is actually trying to do something with the system directly, they're trying to submit something. And at least what I observed in, for example, machine learning, they have SDKs, right? Like they start from an SDK, they define everything in the code, in Python, etc. That's their API for submitting jobs and then everything after that is handled by the SDK, it creates 
Kubernetes objects, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know if that like model can translate to something like for, with Slurm is the same thing. You have probably these command line interfaces that people grown like used to, like Slurm, submit, and all these things. And I guess it, it depends on the type of workload. But I feel with Batch, we need an SDK. We need these command line tools, and then those translate into something else. It depends on how you set up the system. To extend to his question, do you think like a batch need to support like a multi-tenant support? Yes. Uh, there's a huge push for multi-tenancy support, um, and that's why we're also looking at the, the, the side of the user quotas and all that kind of stuff. So f we see that push from from the users that we've got. Um, and then multi-tenancy doesn't mean for, for them multiple companies, but even within companies, there's different groups that get a quota assigned or different users that have got a quota assigned. So yeah. We, we do see that, and that's huge pressure. Yeah, indeed. Also in uh, Armada, I mean, we have many users internally, and uh, there's a lot of, uh, like, it's very important, obviously, to the users that each of them get their fair share, because they will come and complain to us if we don't give them their fair share. And so for this reason, we do have all of these things. We have sort of per-user uh, quotas, we have per user quotas per scheduling round so that not a single user can hog too much capacity over a short span of time. Um, and then, yeah, also the sort of total capacity of each particular cluster per user as well. And then we schedule jobs in an order determined by which user has the lowest fraction of their quota currently. And then we also have per priority class quotas so that if you have some preemptible jobs, we can give you more resources than if your jobs are non-preemptible. Uh, yeah, just an observation on all these things we're designing. Is it the case that really we're all just sort of architecting and optimizing around the fact that, well, a few things, we're all scared of breaking etcd. And if that's scaled, just imagine it's scaled infinitely, then that wouldn't be a problem. And then... Secondly, the multi-cluster thing, I think we all want that because that's a sensible thing to have for operational and resilience reasons. If there was just an automatic way that Kubernetes clusters could be somehow aware of each other, if we imagine both those two problems were solved, then we would all be kind of unshackled to just build whatever solutions we want on top of it and it would be more obvious what the right one was for everyone. That's just my observation. I don't know what you guys think about that. Should we focus on scaling etcd first or looking at a different backend for Kubernetes maybe and having it use it in a more controlled way that wouldn't just allow you, a rogue user to destroy it with a single single button click? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> we haven't really looked, um, at least our group hasn't really looked at the replacing the backend, but definitely the... <laughs> You know, that's the big scare. That's the motivation that some of our um, end users have multi-clusters, is just essentially to, to handle those limitations. So um, it's a good point, and I don't know any if there's any work around that, but um, it's very valid. And I think you're right. It would, once That's the biggest driver for multi-clusters on our end. I should, I should say that uh, part of the motivation for creating the, the flux operator was to uh, was to avoid a perceived limitation of etcd as well, in the sense that we would create this batch system uh, with inside of Kubernetes that then can subdivide the resources and handle um, the same number of tasks that flux natively can handle, which is um, tens, hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of tasks. I mean, this goes back to the first question they asked. Is actually etcd a fundamental part of Kubernetes? Kind of is not, right? Like, it's just the storage solution that they chose at the beginning, but it can be replaced with something that is, you know, infinitely scalable, globally scalable, right? We have such solutions in our cloud, multiple cloud providers. If we just adapt the etcd API to those storage solutions that are globally scalable, 
it will solve most of these problems. Maybe we can have Kubernetes on uh, Pulsar. Hi, I, I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity for other projects like Slurm to to actually work with the Kubernetes community to develop, you know, queues and different APIs so that Slurm could actually do a lot of the scheduling and resource control that people are asking from the batch community, but treat a Kubernetes cluster as a resource. And, you know, then, f you know, you could filter a lot of the problems. I, I agree with that CD, but I think that's a solvable problem. But if you had something like Slurm that was extended, you know, people could still submit jobs as they're used to today in the HPC community or some internal communities. I know a lot of people are also LSF users. They'll dump hundreds of jobs over thousands of nodes. But that could be an opportunity to, to merge those two communities or, or work with those two communities to solve some of these problems because they've already solved them for, you know, bare metal clusters or, or other types of compute. But I guess is this most of these schedulers they did they were not built for Kubernetes. I guess Unicorn was was unic like Unicorn is some component outside Kubernetes. Um, same thing with um, with your scheduler. You just use the scheduler plugins to basically offload the scheduling or like call call outside into an external service. It can be done the same thing with Slurm. Like, I mean, what I'm trying to say is that that model is actually being adopted in multiple other projects other than Slurm. Um, first, I wanted to comment on uh, etcd. I remember one of the topics of the last Contributor Summit in Valencia was that etcd was in a crisis, trying to find uh, maintainers. So I guess my question is, are we not doing enough as a batch community to, you know, uh, go back to to etcd in this case and uh, improve it for our needs? And same about applications um, like Spark or Yarn and, and uh, MPI. Those are all very old uh, frameworks uh, that kind of assume that they have like certain characteristics and in, in like they don't know about pods they just assume they're running in, a, in bare metal even um, they assume everything is uh, you, you only run when everything is already uh, set up and should we be reaching back to let's say open api um, intel api or uh, spark um, in, um, maintainers to actually help them or like uh, help them um, be more cloud native to be more resilient to failure. Um, I recently was in a discussion also with Tim Hawking uh, where there was a cap about discussing a startup order of containers. And Tim Hawking was saying, well, the containers should be resilient to not uh, having all the setup already there, but that's not the reality, right? MPI operator has that problem. Um, and I don't know about Spark too much, but uh, so back to my question, like, are we doing enough reaching back to those communities? Are we um, helping them move forward? So it, they simplify the things for us as, Kubernetes developers and so on. So I just wanted to comment on the, the MPI at least. I think that's a really, really interesting point. Um, I, I think there are efforts in MPI to make it more, to make the communicator more flexible in the sense of dynamically adding or removing ranks, but I, I don't know where that is. I don't think that's production re ready. I think that's mainly research at this point, um, but I think that could be hugely, hugely uh, transformative. Um, one of our use cases, uh, we're using the Ray framework, and we're very involved with uh, with them uh, in helping deliver some of our queuing and, and uh, uh, dispatching policies with them. So um, 
as far as Ray is concerned, we are um, not not enough. I don't know enough about the Spark end. Uh, Spark from its side is pretty flexible, so you can tell it to start up with a minimum number of executors and grow to a maximum number of executors and do all that kind of stuff for you in the background. But the end user needs to ask for it. Um, if they don't do it, then you don't get it. So it's it's partially also a education of the end users to say, this is how you submit and this is what you set up that makes it easier for you. Um, we still see people that run Spark jobs and then all the work is done in the driver, but they're asking for 10 other executors and waste an enormous amount of resources. And then you tell them and they say, hey, this is what you're doing. And they say, oh, I wasn't aware that I was doing that. They don't have the view, they don't look at it. Um, like Weiwei said, hiding a lot of the things and, and they just want to submit the job and want it run quickly and they want to get the results back. That's a lot of the end use that you get when you, want, you run the Spark things. And I think that's the same with the guys from Armada. The people just submit the job, they want to get the result back. They don't look at how have I submitted this and how many resources did I waste up until you tell them here's the bill in the end. And then they start complaining. So, but they, they don't get that because there's no user accounting, there's no, so there's, if we provide that information back to them, we can educate them and they will run better. So. Thanks. Is this okay? Yeah. Hey. Um, so I came into this very much from a services background, and I work at a finance company, and we're we're starting, you know, doing a lot of batch and we're thinking about Kubernetes for that. And it kind of the reason why I mentioned that is that like you don't really care about users in services, and we've talked a lot about how in batch you really do, and it's you know we talked a lot about queuing and scheduling and so on. Um, and then I kind of it feels like a lot of the solutions like there's nothing native in Kubernetes to correlate the idea of a scheduling user to a workload. Like you kind of schedule it and then it's never associated with you again. And so we're all kind of building tools around it to help with that. And I'm kind of curious about, we talked a lot about scheduling, but storage is another problem that I'm really struggling with this. I've spoken to people here about it already. I'm kind of curious about that idea of, do we think there's a way to better correlate the like scheduling user or information about the user into Kubernetes itself? Or do we feel like we have to keep relying on building external things around it? And kind of parallel onto that, like, how are you guys, or what do we think the solutions are for kind of interacting with non-API driven object storage, so POSIX file systems, shared clustered file systems in a way that might actually work, because the people I've spoken to here don't seem very happy with the solutions they've built, even if they've managed to make it work. Um, So we are, we are very much in this uh, situation where our users use a lot of file systems for various operations to load data and so on. And indeed, this is one of the main issues with stability and performance on our platform, whereby, say, all of your users simultaneously try to get that the same file on a file share, and then everything falls over. So I think what we would really like in the long term is some way for Kubernetes to be aware of the health of the underlying health and capacity of the underlying file storage systems and to be able to share those resources effectively because really this is something that we don't have at all and it's really causing us a lot of pain. Do you have a question? Yeah. Sometimes in the HPC world those sorts of problems are solved via tiered storaging like burst buffers and that sort of thing. So I wonder if there'd be some interest in the community, Kubernetes community or integrating that if it hasn't already been done. Using the fact that nobody wants to ask a question, I just wanted to throw a comment defending at CD. But this is, this is uh, as I'm working on Google Kubernetes Engine and uh, our internal testing pipelines test clusters up to 15,000 nodes by cluster. The largest production clusters that our customers have are to have 12,000 nodes. 
old spot, so very heavy on like re recycling and preemption. So like, th this is a very powerful tool. Like we need to fix a couple of problems like that Aldo mentioned, like on ma mm, quality of maintainability, reliability with new releases, um, that stuff. But uh, like I, I wouldn't like go well one without the impression that it's it's a really bad storage system. It's a really good one. The community may need a little bit help, but but yeah. As there are no questions, I, I was going to do uh, make a, a similar comment, which is a couple of months ago, people realized that etcd was left with one maintainer. But that's that was a problem with the project, but it was um, uh, also a show of uh, the community that has been built around these tools. Because as soon as there was a call for help, there were a bunch of companies that jumped in and actually volunteered resources to, to fix it. and. Maybe etcd is the current problem, but these problems keep repeating themselves with a bunch of tools that after the hype and when they become kind of stable, lose interest from a lot of people. Uh, so we are seeing it with etcd, but we'll see it with any, any number of tools that will keep coming. So jumping out of a solution is sometimes not the best option. Maybe, maybe there's room to fix it. And then I, I had another comment, which was uh, uh, regarding the um, the opportunity of running batch on Kubernetes. Th there are many options, as we've heard today. But I, I had a question, because I come from an environment where we were doing massive scale computing before the cloud appeared. And we built a bunch of custom tools uh, for two decades that we still run. And uh, moving those to Kubernetes has been a massive simplification. And it also democratizes a bit the access to a large amount of resources with the public cloud. Um, I'm, I'm, I wonder um, how, how much of uh, an effort should be in these common APIs, given that we already have the Kubernetes API as a base to access to all these resources. You, you have options on premises, you have options on all the ma major hyperscalers. Um, how do you see the, the benefit of actually putting a lot of effort into having these single extensions to the job API and, and um, some sort of single scheduler? instead of just relying on the base Kubernetes API and um, and then people choose whatever they choose on top. Uh, how much effort do you think uh, we get, how much benefit do you think we get from this uh, potential effort? So from um, our point of view, I think it's a lot of benefit. Um, you can, as you hear um, the talks today and from the other fellow panelists, there's a lot of common challenges that we have. And to be able to solve as many of those we can with one code base and have uh, a community that supports that same code base, I think it uh, becomes more effective, we become more efficient, right? And um, uh, we can evolve it, I think, a, a lot quicker. Uh, so I think there's a lot of benefit. Now, I don't know if we'll be able to be able to provide all of the different features and fancy things that we've maybe individually in our projects have provided, but I think if we can try to gather as much of the common uh, functions and features, I think it'll benefit the community very much so. Uh, we have time for one last question. Do you have a comment? I guess a little bit more on the etcd thing. I actually think, like for us, it's always never been etcd. The API server can go down, right? Because you have like a thundering herd because you have so many nodes. And, you know, there's a lot of these lessons we've learned internally. We've learned from each other just inside of our company. Unfortunately, we mostly were proprietary. I kind of have a question, like this has been an incredible forum, but it's been like one, one day, maybe one, two days out of the year. I would really love to, be able to communicate and, and be able to have these kind of wonderful showcases. What else can we do to encourage and to have more forums and more opportunities for folks to, you know, be able to present and have and talk like this? So Alex Gadman is raising his hands in the back. All right. I think we have run out of time. Do you, uh, any final remarks?
I'll just mention that there are um, there are containers in HPC and orchestrated containers in H HPC workshops at the supercomputing conference as well, and that's starting to gain, gain traction. We're starting to see a lot more users in that, so coming from that direction would be really interesting too. And I think those users that are used to kind of bare metal, traditional HPC, would benefit a lot from hearing some of these presentations too. Okay, and final remarks. I wanted to apologize for laughing, but Alex was back there waving his hand and saying. So yeah, I, 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 uh, I want to thank everybody for um, doing the presentations and coming in and sharing their, their, their thoughts, ideas, requests. And I, uh, again, I just want to encourage you to uh, come to the batch work group uh, and help us uh, at least try to solve some of your issues or note be able to identify those so we can make recommendations or hopefully upstream some changes. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah, la last remark also. Uh, I think also from an Apache Unicorn, we'll s we we're seeing way more traction out of the old big data kind of workload kind of moves over onto the Kubernetes side. So there's um, there is demand now from that side, so we'll see more of that. And I think when I looked at all the presentations today, we all have the same kind of limitation on either the job API or, so it's, it's not that we wanna do different things. We just need to get together in the group and then move on. Yeah, so similar for me. And we built Armada because we needed to address what we perceive to be limitations in Kubernetes. But over time, as Kubernetes can natively sort of address these, we would love to come back closer to just straight up regular Kubernetes again, as close as we possibly can, because we want to use the standard interfaces. All right. Thank you so much.